All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Hope you guys are having a good time at Build. Partied last night, maybe a little bit. <laughs> I'm really happy you guys are all here. There are a lot of sessions competing for attention, but I think this, this will definitely be a good session. And if you pay attention to some of the details, I'm going to ask a question at the end, and you have an opportunity to win a Lumia 928 phone. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> I can't give it away. <laughs> that would be cheating. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to be talking about Windows Phone, an introduction to designing apps. And my name's Karina Black. I'm a senior design lead on the Windows Phone design team. And interestingly enough, I focus on apps, uh, calendar, email, photos and camera, browser, just to give you a few examples. And I care deeply about third-party apps. And today, I'm going to talk a little bit about clearly the importance of apps. And you guys, as developers, how many people are developers? Everybody. <laughs> Designers? Sweet. Uh, all right, so um, you guys in the audience, uh, the importance of you guys to creating great app experiences. I'll touch a little bit on the importance of design thinking. I'm not going to be able to go at length into design thinking. And then I'll spend the majority of my time talking about our design principles and how you can apply them to a real-world application not in a not-so-well-designed state and improve the experience quite a bit. Um, so I think, I think it'll be very interesting. So let's talk about apps. So here's Windows Phone today. It's a great combination of both software and hardware and a fantastic platform for third-party apps. Apps uh, personalize the experience, empower users, bring important information that people care about to their fingertips, and our start screen is a great area for apps to really shine, whether it be Audible, maybe the latest book that you were reading as a user, maybe the latest social messages that you have yet to peruse, um, the latest coupon at your favorite restaurant, um, chocolate chip muffins. I don't have a pointer, otherwise I'd point it out at the top of the screen there, that you might want to make for your kids, um, the latest weather, and the list goes on. Apps are what matter. Um, I think we, we all know that in the audience here. And people gravitate towards well-designed apps. So clearly, all of you in the audience want to create well-designed apps to make your users happy, the people who are using your apps happy, and to make more money. There are a variety of reasons that you want to create great experiences for people. So it's important to think about design. I have a clicker. Um, there is, and I think this is essential to keep in mind, there is no alternative to design. There's only good or there's bad design. And you don't have to be a design rock star to design good experiences. This is uh, Albert Shum, for those of you who don't know. He's my manager. He's actually a rock star in a band. Just kidding. Um, so, again, I think it, it, uh, thinking about design incorporating design, design thinking, and some of the principles that we're going to talk about today into your application development process is going to be really important. Uh, so put on your design shoes. Got to love these shoes. And uh, give it a go. It's something that all of you can do. So I'm going to scratch the surface on design thinking. I can't go at length. So please dig a little bit deeper into design thinking on your own, because it is an important topic. Design thinking is about business, the business viability, technical feasibility, the experience, the, use, the use, usability, utility, and desirability of a product that you're creating. <clears throat> With respect to experience design, this is, uh, this is kind of an overview of the process that you typically take with respect to experience design. Um, and it is flexible. It can work for both agile and maybe waterfall processes. You can work it into your development processes seamlessly. Um, one of the key things, I'm just going to touch on kind of the high-level topics that are really important with, ex, uh, with respect to experience design and design thinking, is clearly you need to have a product idea in mind. Next, you need to know who your user is. So how many of you guys snowboard? Oh, come on. OK, a few of you. So Burton, um, as you can probably 
imagine, I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Burton Snowboards. They have a really great app, so they're kind of top of mind for me. Um, they're targeting a specific audience, and it's very apparent in the product design that you see, the marketing messages that they're conveying. It's not, clearly it's not the elderly. There's a specific audience that they're targeting, and it resonates throughout the experience end to end. Um, and it definitely impacts the design decisions that they're making. So it's important to know who your user is. We in Windows Phone have specific users that we're targeting, one of which is Anna. And just to give you a high-level overview, she's somewhat tech-savvy, juggling life, children. Um, and with what we know about her, it's impacting our design decisions and the products that we're, we're developing. So that's an essential thing to keep in mind with respect to design. Next, get inspired. Um, I'm sure everybody does this already, but I think make it visual when you're getting inspired. You probably go out and you look at the competition. What are they doing with respect to this design problem that you're trying to solve or this problem that you're trying to solve? Uh, look at your users as well. Capture imagery from competitors, uh, others in maybe that problem space, how your users might be performing or, or completing tasks kind of in the problem space that you're, you're trying to tackle. Uh, images from their lives, in, images that inspire and put them on the walls, I'm not kidding. Seriously, put them on the walls, it's not that hard. But if you immerse yourself in it, it's really gonna help you get inspired and help, help you really think about the user and the problem that you're trying to solve. It really is beneficial. Next, you wanna think big. You don't wanna hone in on a specific solution in the beginning of the de design process right away. So in a little bit, we're gonna be talking about a weather application. I love weather applications. Um, and we're gonna use that for some of the demos. With respect to this application, uh, in the beginning, I kind of thought big. Um, There's several ways that I could solve the problem that I was trying to solve. It could be simply a glance and go weather application, just displaying the five day weather forecast. Another uh, possibility that I explored is maybe it presents the five day weather forecast as well as hooking into services in the cloud for activities that I might do given the weather. Um, so it might recommend things that I might want to do, you know, if it's rainy or if it's snowing or if it's sunny. Uh, another idea, um, it, could hook, it could be an alarm clock uh, that wakes me up in the morning, gives me my weather, and then tells, recommends what I might wear on that particular day. So think big. Think of a variety of possibilities for how you might solve a particular problem. Don't hone in on one thing right away. Um, Next, it's really important to wireframe and iterate. And this doesn't have to be a long process. Uh, with respect to this, um, you're gonna wanna detail out your scenarios, understand your scenarios and the tasks that people are gonna be completing when they're using your product. And you wanna, you wanna put it down on paper or you wanna put it in visual form so everybody involved in the design process can look at it. Is it making sense? You know, is this really resonating? Is it really targeting the needs of the user? Are there holes? How can we improve it? How can we iterate? You wanna put it in visual form, and it's really easy to put it in visual form. I, in the studio, actually, we use pen and paper. I work in the design studio, so I'm gonna say studio, so I apologize for that. Um, we use pen and paper, just like you're seeing here. Just you know, sketch it out, pen and paper. You can use other tools as well. I know some people use PowerPoint, some people use maybe Adobe After Effects, taking it to an extreme and making it you know, full fidelity and interactive and beautiful. It just depends on how far you, take, you wanna take it, but pen and paper's sufficient. Get it out visually so people can look at it and kinda understand where things are going. And last, uh, of course, there's the refining. Once you've honed in on a specific direction, Understand your key scenarios, the tasks that people are gonna complete, the problem, the specific problem that you're gonna solve, and the way that you're gonna solve it. You detail out the, you know, the screens. You're gonna get into the finessing of the visual details. Um, and this is an iterative process as well. You start implementing things that are not working. You need to resize them, uh, reassess the visuals. Um, so design thinking in a nutshell. Flew through it really quickly. Be sure and dig deeper on your own. Uh, it is a really meaty topic, and it, it's extremely important to good app design. So now our design principles. Microsoft has a set of design principles that we now use across all of our various platforms, and they're guidelines, but guidelines are really powerful. Um, they've 
shaped our experiences and there's kind of a continuity and synergy among these experiences now. They feel like they're all part, they're all from Microsoft. So guidelines are really powerful. We're gonna take these guidelines and do some tweaking to this weather application that you're seeing here. And let me give a little, con a little bit of context and background just to kind of set the stage. With respect to this weather app, it presents the five-day weather forecast for your current location. It also presents regional weather alerts. And it's targeting a user who's traveling around in a specific region. So let's imagine, you know, salespeople or truckers. Um, um, and what we're seeing here on screen is using our basic templates, our project templates. This happens to be a panorama project template. Uh, basic list box control or long list selector control and text blocks. It's very simple. Not a lot of design thinking went into uh, what you see on screen. So we're gonna, we're gonna fix this in a little bit, applying our design principles. Um, so let's just go ahead and jump right in. Let me give you a summary of our design principles. They're authentically digital, more with less, pride and craftsmanship. And it doesn't wanna go. Fast and fluid, and win is one. So let's look at the details for authentically digital. In a nutshell, it's, t it's uh, about taking advantage of the digital medium. You know, we have services in the cloud, there are other applications that are, you know, solving problems in interesting ways that you may be able to hook into and leverage. Um, it's, it's certainly valuable to take advantage of that and pull that functionality into your, into your application. If it makes sense for the problem that you're trying to solve, why reinvent the wheel? Whoops. Let me step back. It's also about thinking infographic, not iconographic, and don't pretend to be something that you're not. Um, so this is representative of iconography that Microsoft used quite a while ago. It's beautiful. It's definitely modeled after the real world. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this. Contrast that with what you might find for command buttons and iconography in Windows Phone today. Much more simplified, much more in line with, uh, it's, it's infographic, um, something that you might find in transportation graphics. The nice thing about these, this type of iconography is it's not distracting from the content that's most important to users, the stuff that you really want them to focus on. So they can focus on that important content, Utilize these, you know, these may be command buttons, used for command buttons. Utilize the command buttons, but the focus can be on the most important content. So we're gonna dive into our app and we're gonna simplify some of the iconography. So let's take a look at the current state of the app running. Again, it's a very simple app. I can click on regional weather alerts and see the details. So you can see the iconography. It's uh, iconographic, it's not infographic. We're gonna make it infographic. And just to, just to let you know, I'm gonna work in Expression Blend for all of the demos. <laughs> it's, it's a tool that I use, I, I primarily use it. Um, I do a lot of prototyping. And there's a lot of interesting functionality. I could use Visual Studio, but some of the things that I like about it, I just want to call attention to, is there's a toolbox uh, with basic drawing tools. It's, it's kind of convenient. I can draw simple shapes. I could draw uh, the sun for you know, a sunny day if I wanted um, to include in my weather application. There's also sample data. And we'll dig into this a little bit later. But I can create sample data really quickly which is great for prototyping, and I can design my application around it. It just makes it really fast and uh, effective in getting things done quickly, rapid prototyping. There's also, and I'm not gonna go into this, there are interesting animation capabilities. You can do a lot of really funky stuff with animations, um, so be sure and check it out. There's a lot of fun functionality in here. Visual Studio, of course, has extensive debugging capabilities, so you, know, you gotta weigh the pros and cons of each. Um, again, I'm gonna work primarily here. I am gonna, create my iconography in Expression Design. And Expression Design is a free tool. I have references at the end. It's a simple drawing tool, uh, as you'll see here in a moment. Uh, nice, uh, simple drawing capabilities, as you can see in the toolbox here. Properties associated with the objects that I put on the design surface. 
and I can create layers for the different elements that I'm going to incorporate into my art. And this is what we're going to use. So I'm going to show you real quickly before I create, I'm, I'm going to create an iconographic sun to use in my weather application. But before I do that, I just want to talk about a technique that I use on occasion to create simple iconography uh, or, or graphics. I'll oftentimes like snap a photo of something in the real world, whether it be a box, a computer, a person, a chair, a bag, and I'll bring it onto the design surface here, and I'll use this pen tool, and I simply trace it. I'm just going to do this real quickly so you can kind of get a better sense of how you might create simple iconography using this tool. Infographics. Of course, I'd be much more precise if I were creating real a real icon that I'd want to use in my application, but I want to give you a sense of things. I can shift click and drag to create a curve. Uh, shift click and drag. Just roughly sketch out my bag. I'm going to turn the layer off that uh, contained my photograph, and you can see it's getting close to a bag, and I created it super fast. Um, again, if I were doing something for real that I'd use in an application, I'd spend a little bit more time and pay attention to the details a little bit more, but as you can see, it's something, something to consider when you as developers might need to create iconography quickly. So let's create our sun for use in our application. Uh, there are simple shapes here, and I'm going to use the simple shapes to create my sun. I'm going to start with the ellipse, and I'm simply shift-clicking and dragging to create a circle. I'm going to go to the polygon tool now. If I click on the design surface, there are properties over here that I can tweak. I can change the number of points on the star. I'm going to create a star um, to help simulate the sun or represent the sun. I'm going to go ahead and leave it as eight points. Again, I'm shift-clicking and dra dragging. Then I'm going to select all the objects that I just created all two of them. I'm going to align centers. And then there's some uh, fun path operations that you can do, or rather simple path operations you can do. I'm going to do front minus back to create my sun. I'm going to get rid of the stroke. Select my sun. And the cool thing is, is I can take this object that I just created, and I can copy and paste it directly into Blend and work with it here. So I'm going to do that. The uh, illustrations that you see in this application are defined in these user controls. So I'm going to open the one that represents a clear day where I'm going to place the sun. I'm going to hit Control-0 to zoom in so that I can see the sun. And I'm just simply going to replace the existing elements in this view box that you can see in the Objects and Timeline tool window that I have selected with the object that I copied from Expression Design. I'm just control v, uh, pressing Control v to paste it in place. And view boxes can only contain one element, so the other ones were removed. Um, of course, I could have manually deleted them as well. So now I'm going to do a little bit of tweaking on the objects here, object here. I want it to be white, but I want to set the opacity to 30% uh, transparent so that it works kind of nicely with the background color that it's going to sit on. I'm going to save it, close it. And let's go back to main page.xaml. And you can see I have my new iconography in, or my, my new infographic iconography in place. All right, so more with less. Um, more with less is about focusing on what you're good at. You can't do everything in an application. You really need to focus in on the core problem that you're trying to solve for your users and do it well. With respect to this weather application, foc I'm focusing in on the five-day weather forecast and the regional weather alerts because those are the needs of my user. Um, I'm not going to add additional functionality such as the alarm clock that I was talking about or you know, maybe a calendar or recommendations for what you might do that day or what you might wear that day. It just complicates things. I'm going to focus right now on kind of the core functionality that I want so that I can do a good job at it. It's also about content, not Chrome, and letting your content breathe. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. So this is Windows Phone UI back in 2009, prior to Windows Phone 7. And as you can see, there's a lot of uh, visual noise going on, competing for your attention. 
a lot of line work, gradients. It's really hard to figure out what to focus in on. Contrast that with what you'll find in Windows Phone today. Uh, we're looking at the lock screen on the left. Um, and as you can see, there's a nice, elegant background image on the lock screen. And then there's simple type uh, topography used to communicate the date and time, as well as the next calendar appointment for this individual. And then the important notifications that they care about. Really, there's a lot of negative space or empty space on the page. There's the image there, but really that's part of the negative or empty space. What's really important is you know, the next appointment, the date and time. And it's really easy for the user to hone in on that information, because there's not, not a lot competing for attention. Another example, this is a context menu on the camera roll image to the right. Um, in the past. Uh, at least for Windows Phone, you might have found gradients, something visually to simulate like a real world button. It's really not necessary. These are commands, just put the text there. People understand how to interact with this. And it's beautiful, it really lightens things up. So we're gonna go into Blend and we're gonna remove unnecessary elements in our application to start cleaning up the design and allowing users to focus on the important information. Uh, so here we are. I'm going to go into objects and timeline window and expand the elements that are composing this UI that you see here. And um, it is a very simple weather application showing the five day forecast for your current location. There's really no need to say San Francisco. I know I'm in San Francisco. There's really no need to say weather. I know this is the weather application. So I'm going to get rid of that information as well as the regional alerts title on the other. Uh, panorama page. It's just uh, adding to the clutter and I'm going to remove it because it's not adding any value. So I'm selecting my panorama, going into the property window, and I'm just simply going to delete the title. I'm going to do that for the headers and e each of the panorama pages as well. And then I'm going to build so that things shift and move up. Just take a quick look at it. So now it's really focused on the five-day weather forecast and the regional alerts information. There's still work to do to get this thing to look the way that we're going to eventually want it to look. Um, but it's moving in the right direction. So I'm going to do a couple more tweaks and show you some of the system resources that are available to work with and talk about uh, local resource dictionaries as well, or resource dictionaries. Um, I'm going to color the background for weather and for the five-day weather forecast and the regional weather alerts, different colors, so that they're easy to kind of distinguish between the two. Um, so I'm going to select my layout route. I'm going to uh, create a background color. And I'm going to go to my color resources. And as you can see in here, I want to call attention to some of the system color resources that are available. Uh, uh, we provide these for you to take advantage of, and if you utilize them, your app will respond to theme uh, changes or theme settings that your user makes. So for instance, if they choose to have a darker or light background um, and a specific accent color, your app, as long as you're hooking up to these system colors properly, will respond nicely to those theme settings that your user makes. We're not gonna do that in our app. We're gonna use the resources that we've defined in our resource dictionary. Um, so I'll go ahead and scroll up, set the background to a nice subtle shade of dark gray, and then I'm going to set the weather panel pano, to this blue color resource. And I want to get rid of this gray margin on the left, so I'm going to go down to margin and set it to negative 12. quickly build, and it's starting to look interesting. All right, so pride and craftsmanship. Pride and craftsmanship, I guess um, I would summarize it as the details really matter. It's important to pay attention to those details with respect to the quality. The user's perception of your application is definitely impacted by your attention to the detail. Um, it's also, I, I think another key element to keep in mind with respect to pride and craftsmanship is embrace topography. It is an element that you're going to utilize in most apps, um, make it beautiful, 
uh, incorporate it into the UI and make it a beautiful, you know, uh, engaging element and part of the overall design. Another important thing is you want to embrace font, uh, utilize font weight si and size to convey hierarchy in the information on the page. This is really important. And use the grid. We actually provide a grid now in our project templates. We utilize the exact same grid when we create, it, when we create our native um, experiences. Use the grid to guide layout and alignment of your applications. It will help you create a consistency, a cohesiveness across the various screens in your UI and better take advantage of that negative space. And we talked a little bit about that before. It can draw the eye to what's most important in your app. So it's really important. So here's an example, a set of examples of what not to do. Um, the image on the left is using Comic Sans. It's the best font ever, right? Um, there's nothing wrong with this font. I mean, let's just be real. There's really nothing wrong with this font. It's not the best for readability, especially on small devices. There are much better fonts that you can choose. Another problem with this is all the fonts are the exact same size. How as a user do I know where to look? Everything's kind of competing for attention, and there's really not a lot on this page. Um, what do I pay attention to first? What do I pay attention to next? Draw my eye through the information using hierarchy, you know, incorporating hierarchy into the information on the page, and that's not doing it well. Um, the other image use, is, has our grid overlaid on top, and it's calling attention to the fact that in our weather application in its current state, things aren't aligned nicely. Um, and interestingly enough, users may not notice things aren't aligned nicely and with precision. It will negatively affect their perception of your application, though. So you want to you want to pay attention to those details. Contrast that those screens with what we're seeing here. This is an example on the left of our messaging UI. It's very clear that you're in our messaging UI and you're looking at the conversations. It's also very clear because the fonts are big and bold who you're having conversations with. And then you see a sneak peek at the conversational details, and it entices you into that message so that you can have communication back and forth with that individual. There's a nice hierarchy in the information displayed. It looks really nice, great font choices. Happens to be our SIGO WP that you, you can utilize by default you know, by using our SDK. Um, I do want to mention, you don't have to use SIGO WP. You can use fonts. You can use sans serifs, serifs, whatever makes the most sense for your partic particular application. Um, but do keep in mind some of the things that we talked about. Incorporate hierarchy, make, uh, in, in, ensure that the typography is working beautifully on your screen. The other image is just showing the precision in some of the comps that we did um, uh, back in you know, the early days of Windows Phone 7, making sure that things align nicely to the grid. So we're going to go into our app and apply, some of, uh, apply this principle to our experience and make it much better. And I'm going to start with the weather alerts, uh, work in this space. And um, I, I want to do something interesting, so I want to introduce you to the Windows Phone Toolkit, for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, I want to create two columns of weather alerts. Let's imagine in our particular scenario, there are a lot of regional weather alerts. And these people are traveling, our particular target audience traveling a lot. They want to be able to glance in and get a general sense of as many weather alerts as possible. So we're going to present two columns of information so we can get more on the page, so they can glance at it. If they want to look at the details for a particular one, they can click on or press on it and go to the details for that particular weather alert. So two columns of information. And I'm going to use a wrap panel, which is in the Windows Phone Toolkit, to take advantage of two columns. Um, <clears throat> something else that uh, I want to talk about, uh, I'm going to retemplate the list box here that, that defines how uh, the information appears on screen. And there are several, all of our controls actually have XAML that define how things are appear. And you can modify it. You can retemplate things and customize it for your particular needs. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Um, we're looking at, I actually have highlighted here, uh, the, the, the primary template, this template defines maybe the line work around the list box, the appearance of the scroll bar. There are other templates uh, that define how the information for each list item appears, as well as how the information is organized on the page. We're going to dive into the one 
That defines how the information is laid, on the, uh, laid out in the list box. That's this items panel here. And I've created a template already that utilizes the wrap panel. Again, it's in the toolkit. Um, and let me just call attention to the fact that I would need to download and install the toolkit, make a reference to it in my project, and then I could access the wrap panel in the assets library here and simply double click to add it to my design surface. I've created a template already that I'm gonna use, so I don't need to do any of this. Uh, so I'm gonna edit the items panel and the template with the wrap panel is this items panel template. And let's just take a peek at it. Just so you can get a sense of how this is working. Oops, I'm gonna do split view so I can see the design surface and the XAML simultaneously. So this is the template that we're now referencing. It's using the toolkit wrap panel. And if I go back to the design surface, we don't see two columns of information, right? So uh, there's still a little bit more work to do. The reason is, is because the template defining how each item in the list box is presented is filling up the entire horizontal space. So I'm gonna go into that template and do a bit of tweaking. That's this item template. I'm gonna edit the current one and you can see the XAML elements that are making it up. Uh, it's a stack panel with two text blocks. I'm just gonna set the width on the parent element, the stack panel, to 184. Of course, I've done some experimentation and I know exactly how I want things to go. So now I have two columns of information. Okay, so the next thing I wanna do is I wanna incorporate more hierarchy into the information displayed on the page, the title for each alert, as well as the details. They're, they're basically the same font size. Sure, one's yellow, but I want to make it a little bit more, a little bit more of a dramatic difference between the two. So I'm going to start with a title and select that text block. And I'm going to utilize uh, the system resources for fonts. There are system resources available for colors, for font uh, faces, for font sizes, margins, a variety of system resources that you can leverage. I'm going to use the system resource uh, for the font face, and I'm going to choose font, font Family Normal. We don't see anything change drastically. I'm also going to use a system resource for the size, and I'm going to set it to phone font size large. We didn't see things change drastically, um, but I don't want to go any bigger, and the reason is, is I want to ensure that it's, you know, clipping is minimized, and I also don't want wrapping. So I'm gonna change my data, and this is the cool thing with the sample data, is I can play with the design a little more seamlessly. I can go into my sample data. Uh, I'm looking at my alerts here. I can go to the collection and click on the tub that you see, and I can edit my sample data. I'm gonna make them all caps, the title. And I'm just simply editing what we see, hitting enter, whoops. Try that again. And I make my changes and it updates and there's definitely more hierarchy in the information. The titles stand out distinctly from the details below, more in line with what I want. The next thing I wanna do is the alignment of these elements is uh, slightly off. And again, it is important that you pay attention to even those types of details, the alignment of elements, the position of elements. So we're gonna use the grid, again, uh, uh, available as part of our project templates now to help us align things. So I have it here, and you see it in objects and timeline tool window, I've selected it. It's collapsed, I'm gonna simply make it visible. And I'll zoom in and Things aren't aligning nicely, as you can see. I'm gonna go into my template for the list box items, and I'm gonna do some tweaking of what we're seeing here. First of all, I'm gonna, I want the title at the top to align perfectly with that top grid row. Um, so I'm just gonna tweak the top margin a bit until I get it to where I want. 10 happens to be the right setting 
uh, with respect to the top margin. I also want the subsequent items to align nicely with one of the grid rows. So I'm just going to play with it a little bit, uh, the bottom margin, until I get it to where I want. 16. Wow, 16. Seriously, I guessed at that. Uh, 16. So it's looking, it's starting to look good. Things are aligning nicely to the grid. One last thing that I want to do is align the details information to the left margin with the title information. So when I select the details, I go down to margin, and for some reason, the margin is 20. So I'm going to select it, and I'm just going to set it to 0. And as you can see, I'm hitting Control-0, Control-minus to zoom out. Um, I'll step out of the data template and turn off the grid. Things are starting to look a lot better. Hierarchy and the information displayed on the page, attention to the details, things are aligning nicely. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the five-day weather forecast, but I'm going to move a lot quicker. I'm going to use a, a set of templates that I've created previously, and uh, it'll help me move much faster. But same idea. <clears throat> so a couple of things. I, uh, I want to draw attention to today's weather. Uh, that's what I care about most, the user of this application. That's what we've determined. So I'm going to make it bigger and bolder. Um, and then we'll have the four-day weather uh, forecast down below. To do that, I'm going to just tweak some of the elements that we're seeing in this panorama page for the, the weather forecast. I'm going to right-click and group that list box into a stack panel. I want the stack panel to be uh, oriented vertically, so I'm just going to verify that in the property window. And it is. Expand my stack panel. Now I'm going to copy. Actually, I'm going to control, click, and drag, essentially copy and paste a duplicate of that list box um, into this stack panel. I'm going to double click and rename the top list box today. And the bottom list box, four days. And then I'm going to set the height on the top list box to, right now it's 764, and it's taking up all the vertical real estate. I'm going to set it to 435 so that I can see the items below. <clears throat> I'm also going to auto size the list box below in terms of height so it fills all the available space that it needs. And then I'm going to change the data that's used in this top list box. And I created sample data for today's weather um, previously. So I'm just going to simply access that sample data collection that we're seeing here and drag and drop it from the data panel onto the design surface. And it looks awesome, right? Woohoo! Um, <laughs> like I said, I have a design, I have a template that I've created previously. I'm just simply going to point to that template, and it's going to drastically change the appearance of this information. Added additional templates, the item template for this thing. I'm going to apply a resource. It's going to be this particular one. And things drastically change. Great hierarchy in the information. Today's weather, temperature is really like big and bold. That's exactly what I want. Now I'm going to do the same thing with my four-day weather forecast. Again, to move quickly, I'm just simply going to apply a template that I've created previously. And it's this one here, weather data template underscore new. And when I do that, it's starting to look really good. Uh, it's clean. Uh, there's not a lot distracting from the most important content. Things align perfectly. And one last tweak. These are list boxes, and they scroll. I don't want them to scroll. There's no need for them to scroll. So I'm going to go and search for my scroll bar or scrolling uh, in the properties window. And I have both of them selected in the objects and timeline tool window. And I'm going to disable vertical scrolling. And let me just build this. And we can take a look at where we're at. So it's looking much better. No vertical scrolling. Good focus on the important information. Nice hierarchy in the information displayed, um, heading in the right direction. Uh, pride and craftsmanship is really a big one. That's why I spent a lot of time on it. I think it's important to really pay attention to those details, um, hence the time that we spent with it. Oops. All right. 
So fast and fluid. Fast and fluid's about creating experiences that are responsive and alive, uh, really drawing the user in. It's also about uh, in introducing context and delight through use of motion into the experience. And this is an interesting quote from one of the motion designers on the, the Windows Phone design team. Your design isn't finished until you see it in motion. Motion's critical to our experiences. We're using it throughout to help provide context, uh, to guide the user, to help them um, understand how the interface is going to react as well as incorporate like delight um, into the experience. And we can see some examples here. So I'll play that again because it's really fast. But the bottom item where it says Dinara Read, you'll see a tilt animation when you press on it, and then you see a nice transition to the new page. There's a continuity, a structure. Um, and also the user's, uh, the user's expectations are set with respect to when something's pressed on, and they see a tilt, it's gonna navigate them to a new page. Let's do it again. It's really fast. So you can take it to, you can take it much further. This is an animation that, an exploration that we did in the studio. We've, we've, we've had this for quite a while, but it's showing some of the interesting things that you can do with respect to animation to both guide and delight users. And it's a really good example. So we're gonna, utilize animations from our Windows Phone Toolkit uh, to add some of the structure and some of this delight to our weather app. So again, the animations, well, we have animations available in the Windows Phone Toolkit that you can fairly easily use. So you, uh, we talked about this with respect to wrap panel. You're gonna need to download and install or in, you know, make sure you have the um, toolkit incorporated into your project. Um, you're also going to need to do a couple of other tweaks with respect to page transitions, so I'll quickly walk through some of those. Um, first of all, you're gonna need to go into app.xaml.cs, open that up, and I'm gonna search for root frame. And you wanna make sure that, I've already said it, you wanna make sure that you're using transition frame rather than the default that you get when you utilize one of our project templates um, because that's part of the toolkit and that will enable the nice page transitions. So I've already done that. Go ahead and close that. And the next thing you're wanna, gonna to wanna to make sure and do is incorporate I've placed the styles that define how the animations um, are described. In app.xaml, you can place them in the resources for the page. Uh, it's kind of convenient doing, placing them in the resources on, in app.xaml because you can use them across your project. All of this is available, all this information describing what you need to do is in the Windows Phone Toolkit, but you, can, you get a glimpse of what, uh, what you need to do. Incorporate that XAML, so I have that in there. And once I do that, I simply need to re-template the page itself. I'm gonna edit the template, and I'm gonna point to, okay, maybe. Let's try that again. Edit, I'm gonna point to the template that I, uh, for the slide transition. I'm gonna use a slide transition because I'm, I want something subtle and uh, slide transition is appropriate for moving from one context within an application to uh, a deeper context. Um, so it's this slide page style that you're seeing here. Then I'm gonna do that on the alert details page. I'm also gonna do one tweak before I, I'm gonna delete my search term from the property window and I'm gonna paint the color that dark gray using my color resources on the details page, then I'm gonna select the root, the phone application page, and do exactly what I did on mainpage.xaml. Right click and edit template, apply resource, apply the slide page style. And one more thing, I want that tilt effect that we saw in the animation that I showed you uh, in email, in the slide deck just a moment ago. To do that, I actually need to go into the XAML for the list box. Uh, so I'm gonna select my alert list box in the objects and timeline tool window. I'm gonna uh, bring split mode into view so that I can see the XAML for the list box. Then I'm simply gonna type toolkit, 
tilt effect, is tilt enabled? True. And maximize so I can see everything on the design surface. And I'm going to build. Whoops. All right, so you can see I have a tilt on these items. It's cluing me into the fact that when I press on one of these, I do an actual press. It's going to navigate me to a new page. And we saw that nice slide transition. I press back. We see a nice slide transition back to the previous context. All right, the last one, win is one. Uh, win is one is about leveraging the system as well as thinking platform. With respect to leveraging the system, we have a set of controls and application patterns that you can leverage in your apps. There are cases where you're going to want to diverge. That's totally, it totally makes sense. We, we encourage that if it makes sense. Um, if it's better use of time to utilize what you actually find in our SDK, you find in the system itself, it's really important to leverage those, those, those controls, those characteristics of the system, um, as well as take advantage of the unique characteristics of the system. So I'm going to call attention to our start screen and our live tiles. There are three templates that you can use to really make your applications pop on our start screen. Um, Flip, the one on the bottom left, is what we've had since Windows Phone 7. And on the front of the tile, you can have an image. You can have some sort of iconography. There's also a space for a notification count. And on the back, you can incorporate some sort of information, interesting information about your application, maybe the latest notification to draw the user in, get them to dive into your application and use it, clearly something that you want. Iconic, uh, t the iconic template is similar to what you actually, what you'll find with like our email and messaging. You have an icon, a notification count, and in the larger, the large tile, you can include information about uh, maybe the latest notification. And then there's the cycle template, which will cycle through a series of images. And of course, you can create custom images on the fly, or you can point to something maybe already incorporated into your project. There are a variety of things that you can do. You just have to open up your imagination um, and think creatively. So we're going to, in a moment, actually I have one more slide. Um, with respect to thinking platform, and I'm not going to go deep here at all, you want to think about how your app works across you know, the variety of uh, mediums. Now, not just on the phone. How does it work on the uh, Surface? How does it work on Windows Phone desktop machines, Windows Phone laptops? How does it, uh, Windows, Windows laptop, sorry. Um, how does it work uh, on, on the television form fa factor, larger screens? All important to think about these days. So let's dig into uh, leveraging live tiles. We're going to leverage the flip tile in our application. And I'm going to, there are a variety of ways that you can design your live tiles. I'm going to work in code. Um, you can do it in XAML. You can do it in code. Of course, you want to hook up to live real data. I'm going to hard code things, so I apologize for that. I really want to get the concept across, the importance of creating a live tile um, that really resonates with users, draws them into your app. You want people using your app and diving in and getting, you know, getting that delight and that important information at their fingertips. Um, so let's take a look at what our live tile currently looks like. And it's not very live, as you'll see. So it's this weather tile. And it's doing absolutely nothing. It has an icon and the name of my application, which is weather. Uh, and we want to make it a little bit more inviting for people. So again, I'm going to do it in code just real quickly. One of the first things that I want to do is it's local. It's, it's, the application is providing weather for your current location. So I'm going to tell the user what the current location is on the, the tile itself. So. I'm going, to say, I'm going to change the title to San Francisco. Of course, we would need to do this dynamically. I'm hard coding. Again, I apologize for that. Um, I also want to change the icon on the front. I want it to be this image that I've already predefined called background image. Again, you'd want to do it dynamically. And I want more details on the back with respect to what the current weather is actually like. Um, 
So I've made some changes, and we'll see it's a much better design, and it's going to draw you in as a user a little bit more than it was previously. So we see our live tile. It's talking to the weather in San Francisco. It's currently clear. When it flips over, we're seeing that skies are clear, and it's 62 degrees. Much more informative. We'll take it a little bit further now. Um, just some ideas to play with. Uh, we've talked about this. Our users for our weather application care about these regional weather alerts. So we want to provide a notification count for the number of regional weather alerts. So I'm going to provide that count to draw them in on the tile. I'm also going to change the background image to something, bear with me here, a little bit more informative. I'm going to include both the uh, a, an icon indicating what the current weather is like as well as the temperature. And then on the back, I'm going to do something fun. I'm going to make the background image something that indicates what kind of a recommendation. We want to, you know, these are salespeople, these are truckers, maybe we want to get out of the car uh, on occasion, you know, get outside and see things. So we're going to make a recommendation for what they might do on that particular day. A little bit of delight in the tile. Um, so, whoops, my mouse just died. There we go. All right. So we'll build it. And we'll see that it's getting a little bit more fun. Oh, wait. Let's go back. It's not quite fun yet. All right. So we're seeing the current weather conditions for San Francisco, as well as uh, regional alert notification details or indicator. And on the back, it's saying, hey, get outside and enjoy the weather. Have fun. Just a little bit more delight. Life tiles offer, you know, like it's a platform on which you can really think creatively. Be sure and take advantage of it. All right. All right, so that's, um, that's the gist of it. And I did, I did talk a little bit about expression design. Um, it's available for free. There's a download link here, the Windows Phone Toolkit. I reference that a lot as well. So be sure and check that out if you're not already. And um, we have 19 Windows Phone talks, fierce reduction, getting rid of the excess, uh, forced me to select four that would fit nicely on the page that I want to recommend, starting with the Windows Phone UI and XAML, which is later this evening. I think it's going to be a nice extension addition, you know, add, add on to what I've discussed today and really kind of take you into some, some more of the details. So I think that'd be a really good talk with Sean Oster. Windows Phone tiles, lock, and notifications are all important to uh, the Windows Phone experience. And this, this talk that I'm referencing here um, by Thomas Fennell really digs into the details there. So I think it's also another really good talk that you might want to check out. Um, and then building for both Windows and Windows Phone, another really important talk. And then app-to-app -app communications. Like, there are capabilities now where you can leverage, I kind of alluded to this a little bit, leverage the functionality of other apps, um, if possible. Why reinvent the wheel? Um, and there are, it, 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 it's, it's possible to do, so I think that'll be a good talk as well. Um, so thank you, everybody. Are there any questions? And, and um, before we actually get to the, the, the question, where you guys, where we can win a phone. Be sure and remember to fill out your evaluation forms if you get a chance. Uh, we'd really appreciate it. Um, any questions before we do the drawing for the phone? Yes. So I think one thing that I struggle with as a developer who can't design is um, how do I create or come up with an icon for an abstract concept? Like the one that I kind of refer to is voicemail. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think word association, brainstorm with other people, ask them for, you know, what, you know, what voicemail means to them. Um, pull in, I, you could do searches on the web, um, you know, on Bing. And um, <laughs> um, 
uh, search for a specific term, and there's a, a tab that you can go to that will present you know, imagery. You can look at those images. I think that's good. I, I actually use that quite a bit to help me kind of think out of the box. Just one idea or a couple of ideas, actually. So yeah, I hope that helps. How does it work? Um, I'm not the expert on that, so I have to apologize. But when you're using our project, when you're using our project templates now, um, um, they'll default to the largest screen size, and you create all of your assets and resources for the largest screen size, largest res resolution, and then they'll scale down automatically for you. You can build for the different um, the resolutions, and it will automatically scale down. So it's actually, like, I think our recommendation, again, I'm not the expert on this, I apologize for that, is to design for the largest size, and then it will scale down. So if you have a bitmap, um, you're going to create the, the, you know, for an icon, you're going to create the largest size icon, and then we scale it down for you. Um, so you'll, you'll want to double check. Again, I'm not the expert. All right. Oh. Um, there are, yes, <laughs> do you want to, do you want to catch me afterwards and I can, I'll, I'll find out where it is and I'll share that with you. I apologize. I don't know it off the top of my head. I should repeat the questions. I'm sorry. Um, is, so the question was, is the grid alignment tool only available in expression blend or is it available elsewhere? It's actually part of all project templates. So if you create a, you utilize one of our project templates in Visual Studio or Expression Blend, you'll get it. It's available, and of course you can. It's it's simply you know it's a, a GIF or a bitmap of some sort. Um, so you can pull it out and you can use it, you know, for a variety of purposes. So it's definitely available. All right, I think we're, I think we're out of time. Um, so the drawing. Um, can we have an awesome Windows phone here? <laughs> it is a really amazing phone. I was playing with it a little bit. I'm, I'm kind of jealous. Um, nice and sleek. So the question, can anybody, let me hide this. <laughs> anybody in the audience other, other than Lauren? <laughs> Just kidding, that's totally not fair. <laughs> I know I'm unfair. Um, can anybody name uh, four of the design principles. I saw the hand go up here first. Hey, you're looking at your phone. You can't do that. <laughs> All right. Awesome. That's it. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. There you go.